Hi, everyone. It's kind of weird because this is one of the first time that we've done this. So we're going to say hi, welcome to another episode of The Cheeky Natives. And uh, today we have a special treat because you'll get to watch us and listen to us. Uh, hey, Dr. Slay. Hey. Um, I'm so excited for today's conversation. I think that, um, you know, we've we've been big fans of Ayobami since forever, but it's really beautiful to be having this conversation. So I have the supreme pleasure of introducing Ayobami Adebayo, who is the author of tonight's book that we're going to be speaking to, A Spell of Good Things. And I'm going to read her bio, just give you a taste of the excellent company that we are in today. And um, her bio goes as follows. Ayobami Adebayo is the author of Stay With Me and The Spell of Good Things. She holds BA and MA degrees in literature from Obafemi Awolo University in Ife, Nigeria, and an MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, where she was awarded an international bursary for creative writing. In 2017, she won the Future Awards Africa Prize for Arts and Culture. Stay With Me won the Nine Mobile Prize for Literature and Prelia Africa week and was shortlisted for the Women's Prize and the Welcome Book Prize. And of course, A Spell of Good Things has been long listed for the Booker Prize. So welcome, Ayubami, and congratulations. Uh, I think congratulations are in order. It's no Thank small you. Thank you so much. Nomination on your sophomore um, novel. So congratulations. Thank you. And thank you both for having me. Um, it's always it's always wonderful speaking to writers that we admire. I suppose we could start here, right? Like, how do you feel about kind of book prizes? I mean, your debut novel was shortlisted for for the prestigious Women's Prize, and now oh. your kind of sophomore novel is uh, also sh uh, long listed, right, for the the Booker Prize. And we always look forward to the long list uh, of, of the Booker Prize as well as the shortlist. And and it's such. So I wanted to think about like as a writer, how do you oh. feel about these awards uh, pertaining to to your writing? I mean, I, I think that I've been fortunate, you know, in relation to prizes. And uh, I'll mention a couple of reasons why I think so. Um, the first being that, you know, um, in 2013, when I'd written maybe about two drafts of Stay With Me, and I wasn't sure, you know, if it was a story that would make sense to anyone else. I had the good fortune of being long listed for um, the Kwani Manuscript Prize and then shortlisted again for the Kwani Manuscript Prize. And I can tell you that it was, um, it was the validation that I needed in those sort of dark moments of self-doubt. It was quite helpful um, for me to feel that, okay, I can keep pushing through um, on this. Because the judges were people that I respected, you know. Um, and to, if they think this is what's been shortlisted, maybe there's something here. Um, so even before Stay With Me was published, I, I, I think I had that good fortune. Um, when Stay With Me was published, um, not only was it shortlisted for the Women's Prize, it was shortlisted within less than a week of being published. So that had quite an effect on the kind of reception that it got, I think, you know. And, I mean, one of the things that prizes do is that they bring all this attention. It's like they have a ready audience that then pays attention to your work. So I'm very grateful for um, the opportunities I've had to, to win or be shortlisted or... Um, in this case, now long listed for the Booker Prize. Um, I do think generally, do that um, they're not everything, you know, um, that there's a lot of good writing that, um, for whatever reason, goes under the radar. You know, I've had the years, I remember, I won't say who, but the year I was shortlisted for the Women's Prize, I mean, there was a book that I thought was the best book I had read in a long time. And he didn't get some of the prize attention that I expected it to get. So those things happen, you know. Um, I think they can obviously do a lot, you know, to spotlight writers that people might not necessarily have paid attention to um, otherwise. Um, but I think for any creative, you, you have to 
you have to create a place in your mind where you have peace. <laughs> So I think that's um, such a beautiful way for us to really begin our conversation around a spell of good things. And I think, you know, just to set the scene, there's something interesting that, that Yeye does, who's the, who's the matriarch of, of the, the book. And Yeye says something to the effect of life was war, a series of battles with the occasional spell of good things. And I think that's such a powerful way to just encapsulate so much of the book. And I think that the first question for us really is, um, in much of the book, we see how inequality and social inequities exist and how they often collide, right? So we see that they, they coexist and they collide and how in much of the book, we see that families want the same things for their fam for their children, but very few of those of those members of the population are able to make those things come true for their children, right? That being said, we see in the book how privilege in itself will not protect you against the inequalities and the corruption and the state failure that exists. And I think it's interesting that we see this collision of these two very different families at different points in the book. And I wanted us to speak a little to why it was important for you to contrast the opulence and the mm. impoverishment, but also why it was important for those two worlds to coexist and then collide. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think it, it came from the point where the idea, you know, for this book started and then how it unfolded in my mind. Um, so I've told the story a couple of times, but I'll tell it again. I hope it won't be too boring to people who might have heard it before. Um, you know, it was in 20, either to late 2012 or early 2013, I was um, living in Ife, and um, it was a city that I'd lived in since I was maybe seven or so. So I, it was a place that I was familiar with, and I thought I knew very well. And then this day, I was coming back from work. I was on the bus, and there was some traffic, and the driver decided to make a detour and take pass through another neighborhood. And we ended up in this neighborhood that was way more impoverished than anything I had seen in Ife until then. And it wasn't that I wasn't aware that people were living at different strata in the society. Um, this was on another level. And if I'd seen it on TV, I would not necessarily have believed it. And for a long time after that, I kept thinking to myself, how could I not have known this? You know, what, how, you know, all kinds of questions, you know, one, how was I so blind to all of this? Um, how is society so structured to make it possible for me not to be aware of all of this, you know, and just carry on with my own life? And um, I kept thinking about it. Um, I remember I wrote a short story shortly after, which was about um, a family that was living in what was the university staff quarters and the family that would come in to clean for them, you know. So I was already trying to think through um the points of intersection, you know, between those kind, those two extremes of sorts in that society. And then um, later that year, I wrote what I thought was a short story. I didn't even know that it would become a novel. So I wrote this short story. And by the time I got to the end of the short story, I suddenly realized that the ideas I was trying to think through, walk through and unpack would require um, a bigger canvas, you know, in a sense. And so that's where it started. I wanted the two worlds to be side by side, you know, because 2013, this is 2023. So I was working on it, um, you know, through most of the 2010s. And, you know, I, I, I saw more and more of that contrast um, in Nigeria, you know, um, extreme opulence even you know even more extreme that is, is in this book and at the same time such extreme poverty you know um this is a country where many people are living at below a dollar a day and in the same country you know a former head of state the I think it was the daughter was getting married and the cake was flown in from the UK uh, the the mind tries to grapple with both, you know. So it was very important for them to coexist in the book. Um, 
because one iteration would be high that you know i've had a couple of people say to me this is this could have been two books um you know it could have been the story of eniola from the beginning to the end it could have been the story of Uraola. but i wanted to set both side by side and um the collision course um was also very important um because i think part of what is um it's uh, indicating or trying to indicate is is a sense of collective destiny, you know, um, regardless of what hand of the spectrum one is on, people are on. Um, because I, I think that in many instances, uh, the idea is that wealth can ins- insulate, you know, or that mm-hmm. people try to use it to insulate and create all these barriers uh, between them and the harsher realities, you know, that are existing. But I, I, I think it has its limitations. You know, it, it does confer some privilege and advantage, undeniably. But in this kind of extreme divide, it's going to have limitations. Mm. I mean, I love that, like that you, 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 you talk about like, Often you think your wealth will insulate you, right? But what what we see in a spell of good things is that even that has its limits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I really kind of, I think you do a lot of brilliant work in kind of excavating the everyday lives of people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but what you also do is you, 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 it's like hard hitting things, right? So we think, for instance, uh, about like the ways in which in various forms, you you deal quite pointedly with how socialization has rendered women romantically vulnerable, right? So, um, you you know, you think about the different types of things, right? You think about Ye Ye, for instance, you think about Inola's mom, and you think about um, Dr. Hura, uh, who in many ways, it's like, it's kind of, it's interesting to see how you use marriage, right? And I think it's particularly prevalent in African societies that Dr. Hura Ala is a, 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 a resident, right? She's do, She's got a medical degree. She's working and she's uh, doing all these particular things. But marriage seems to be used as a tool for respectability, right? Uh, in this society and in African society as a whole. And Hura's kind of social stature or Hura's while coming into womanhood, so to say, is when she gets engaged to Kunle, right? And I wanted to speak a little bit about that, right? So the socialization of rendering women romantically vulnerable, but also put aside the fact that marriage is used as a kind of a, a, a respectability status tool. Wuraola becomes a person, a respectable person, once she is engaged to be married. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's something that uh, <laughs> that uh, it's it's hard not to observe when you grow up as a woman um, in this community. And we with Wuraola, you know, initially I was thinking primarily about our relationship with Kunde, you know, and it was when I because I wanted to tease through the complexities of that you know um it's a on two levels on you know i sometimes say that i i come to writing occasionally to think through some of the questions that i have you know myself and so the two questions i think that brought a lot to the fore in my mind were um well why would somebody stay in this situation you know and and i'd had instances where one one a colleague had been in a similar situation and a friend and um they were both people that you know um i think of as very strong people you know and and it it it, it was very perplexing to me and and then i think because of that because of what i had seen in those two instances i then started thinking to myself well, why do I think this does not happen to someone like that? You know, why why do I have this assumption that, um, oh, no, this kind of woman does not experience this sort of thing? Um, so that's why it was important for me, for her to be, you know, this person who has almost everything together and has... Ooh, who is not without agency of power, 
you know um and it's very clear in the book she has agency she has power and yet she finds herself trapped in the into this and it's what she said that you know the socialization and how it makes women romantically vulnerable so one of the things that I was thinking through or that I thought will, could be useful at some point was to place Worala side by side with a younger sister who is sort of just coming up and you know <laughs> she's a favorite of many people and she is literally <laughs> out there. Like, Motara is out there. I just want to say Motara is out there. Motara for the win. When I grow up, I want to be like Motara. <laughs> she's remarkable, isn't she? And she's, you know, that character who is looking at all of this squarely in the face and saying, why are you saying this to me all the time? You know, and you can sort of imagine that we're our last sort of, mm -hmm. high, you know, listen to all of that, did not necessarily process it consciously, but it's still there somewhere in, in, in you know, in our subconscious. Um, and it's, 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 it's informing some of the decisions and the choices that she was making. And um, it was, I think the socialization one was, was almost, became almost personal at a point for me to include, you know, after Stay With Me was published and I, I you know, I'd already started working on a spell of good things before Stay With Me was published. So I was still writing it. You know, I had this experience where I was doing an event um, in Lagos and it was, for me, it was a good year. You know, I'd been trying to become a writer for how many years of my life I'd finally done it. I was riding high. I was happy with myself, with my life. And, you know, we finished this event and this gentleman walked up to me, random guy, and says to me, um, oh, congratulations and everything. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so far so good. The conversation is nice. And then he says to me, oh, yeah, but are you married? And I'm like, no. I was like, no. And, I, you know, at that point, you, my mind was like, where is this conversation headed? And, you know, it just, you know, he just said to me, you know, you need to make sure that you do that because X, Y, Z, you know, and then he went on. And in the moment, I found it absolutely hilarious. You know, I, I, I was just astounded at the audacity, first of all, and just like, why are you say this to me, random dude? Um, and then you know, after that incident, I, I you know, about maybe a few days later, I started really thinking about it. Like, and I guess I thought to myself, we have a problem here. If you're a random person, if we set up things such so that a random person thinks he can walk up to a woman he does not know and say this to her. Um, we need to talk, my people. Mm -hmm. uh, so um you know, so I think, I mean, the relationship had already been there, but the part that you mentioned about really trying to think through how does a person come to a place where they've received so much messaging that this is all your life matters for, um, mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, and how does that impact the decisions that they make? How does that um, trap them, you know, in situations where they might ordinarily not have been... Um, susceptible to you know or vulnerable to you know i hope i've answered the question <laughs> you have you have and I, I think that speaking to how does a person line up in this i was particularly interested in kunle and his family and there is this understated it's it's almost just bubbling under the surface about how violence in that particular family seems to be an intergenerational inheritance right so mm. you see you see um, Prof Kuka is, you know, she's going through it, you know, where she for days on end will disappear. And as you read the story, these um, appearances that she has in hospital where she's swollen, she can't, she can't see anybody, you realize that they're actually nefarious. So it's not really allergies. It mm. sounds like a woman who is being abused by her partner would mm. say, right? Because why are you constantly in hospital? And when you think about Kunle and you think about their home life, it starts to feel like how Kunle behaves is an inheritance that's been handed to him by not only being socialized as a, as a man in a very particular way, but also by coming from a particular family. And so I'm curious about why you wrote about the violence in that way, because what we see in the relationship is an escalation of violence. So it begins with insecurity right so kunle is 
is very particular about not being a doctor, but also about Wura being a doctor and speaking to him in very particular ways. So it begins with almost this this very, very determined way to just humble her. So she's constantly being humbled, but it's just verbal. And it's the kind of humbling that's gaslighting. So if you go and you tell somebody else, it's like, oh, really? Is that all they said? Okay, that's not so bad. Maybe yeah. you but it's an escalation of violence, right? It's an escalation of violence that begins in a very particular way. Mm-hmm. And I'm very curious about why you wrote about the violence in this book, in this in this personal violence, intimate partner mm-hmm. violence, mm-hmm. in the way that you did, because it's it's very, very, very interesting. Um, so that, I mean, that's very perceptive of you because you know, like you said, the, what's going on with the cookers is sort of an undercurrent, you know. And I, I, I wanted to, it to be an undercurrent because I feel that there is the I wanted that, um, in fact, I wanted many readers to not even see it, you know, because sometimes that's how it is in life that you just don't see it until you then do, and you're like, oh, why did I never notice? that this woman was always having some weird bruises somewhere that, you know, um, so I, it was important for me for that to just sort of like be there and not quite, nobody quite knows what's going on because I think that does, that does happen. And unfortunately, if or when um, the partner then decides to come forward, um, Sometimes they're not even believed, you know, because they're like, yeah, but you were fine, you know. Um, so there, there, there is that. And in terms of the relationship between Kunle and Wurala, I think it's such a complicated situation, you know, because Kunle is this boy who is the only child of two doctors, you know, two professors of medicine, and who somehow hasn't... Um, he hasn't been able to study medicine. I don't think he was even ever interested or talented, you know, enough for it. But definitely there was that push and that pressure, you know, like to be the inheritor of particularly, you know, his father's, you know, legacy. Um, and he's not been that person. And I don't think that it's um, it's just a matter of chance that the woman he gravitates towards is someone who is that person that he was supposed to be. Um, But that tension within himself, it doesn't result in admiration for her. It results in, like you said, a desire to humiliate and subjugate. It's almost like he thinks to himself that by being in relationship with her, some of that shine of sorts can rub off on him, you know, and, um, but as part of the shine, he actually has to be in a relationship with someone who is as accomplished as she is. And that is not, I don't think it's something that he he can live with, you know, and his tendency for violence then, you know, comes. And I, I wanted it to be like you said, you know, a, you know, a slow burn. I wanted it to creep up on the reader um, slowly and surely. And, you know, there's that first scene where the reader sees it happen. And um, I wanted that to, uh, if possible, the reader to almost feel the shock of that moment, you know, because at that point we're in Motara's perspective, you know, and we're watching this thing happen. And it's like what you know and you know we have that switch between um Wurala and Motara so seeing this and experiencing this so I wanted both you know that uh both of that to be that interplay because I, I, I also think at least from some of the research that I did and some of the reading that I did that for many people, that's how it feels the first time, you know, um, it happens. And even the second time and third time. And that shock of it um, can paralyze people, you know, mentally, that they can't even process what is happening to them. And um, the the right expression is, is that I think, you know, is intimate partner violence because... Part of what complicates it is the intimacies, uh, you know, how the intimacies that exist, you know, in this relationship, you know. And I think that from the outside, um, 
it's it's sort of easy to say just walk you know um which you know in the instances that i had this a friend of mine tell me about it that was my instinct you know my mind was like what you know and you know with, with this book i wanted to put myself in there and really think through that like um and think through some of what i had heard and you know and read about how it's often much more complicated than that for people you know and you know, particularly when there's no immediate support system and they have to think about what does this mean for this person and if i do this what does this mean for this other person so it, it was it was something that i i i, I had <sighs> Yeah, I, I wanted to really tease out, you know, um, as much as I could uh, um, in a spell of good things. And my goodness, did you tease it out? Because, you know, the first kind of moment it happens is 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 that, you know, Kunle says, you know, why are you taking Matera's side, right? Like, like, this girl is rude. Like, she just, I don't like the way she says my name, right? And... Wura says, well, she doesn't call auntie or, uh, you know, uncle or brother. She just calls you by the name, right? And then he turns around again as a, a, for me, I feel like that insecurity always showing up where he's like, but she doesn't call you by your name. She calls you Dr. Hora. And then Hora is like, because that's who I am, right? Like also, <laughs> Hora affects me because I work for this. So that's who I am. And I think that moment is like the trigger, right, uh, of that. But I, huh. I'm also interested in kind of the manifestation of the other instances of violence in the book, particularly between these intimate partner violence. But what also fascinates me uh, and what we have been thinking about is, is the kind of idea of, um, the kind of idea of love, power coupling and actual love because you find that um this marriage in many ways is a marriage of of power uh, a marriage of of convenience and of, of prestige right so yes we can say that wara like loves kunle but it seems even yeah yes says right like but this is the family in whose you're supposed to marry because you 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 will be fine for generations, right? So it's it's forward thinking in many ways. But I do think that there are moments in the book where you see Wura deeply thinking about this power coupling versus like uh, a Kingsley, for instance, right? So you think about the, I suppose the precipitating event to the to the slapping is um, Kunde seeing Kingsley walk into the party and says, "Oh, you invited him." And she's like, yeah, months ago, you know, but I didn't think he would remember. He gave up his Saturday. That's so thoughtful, right? And the many moments in which we encounter their interaction, for me, I think there is a tenderness that doesn't exist between Kunle and, and Wura. And that tenderness is also, again, juxtaposed against the idea, do I want power or do I want love, right? And I feel the kind of male insecurity that we see in Kunle is his awareness that Wura doesn't love him in the way that she loves Kingsley, for instance. Whether we want to accept that it may be romantic or platonic, he knows, right, that this relationship may make sense for everyone else, but there is something also that he's looking for that's not quite there. And so any interaction he sees between Kingsley and Wura ignites that insecurity that now uh, manifests in violence. And I wanted us to speak a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean Kingsley is, you know, such a nice guy, isn't it? Um, and and I think that with with Kingsley, there's a sense of um, safety and security that Rola has, you know, that um, with Kunle is just not there. And I and I don't think that it has ever been there even before he started really showing himself up. You know, the other thing is Kingsley is someone that she's known for a bit of time and he has um, sort of proven himself both in a romantic and non-romantic sense. 
you know, uh, and, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I think she just feels safe with and around him um, in a way that anybody around them can pick up, you know, and um, for whatever reason, you know, for different reasons, she's not, um, she's not even thinking about him in a romantic way anymore, you know, at this point in their relationship and their interaction and their friendship. But Kunle is quite insecure, you know, um, and Kingsley is also a doctor, <laughs> you know, so there's that. And he is constantly like checking to see, you know, there's that tension, you know, what you, you said is really apt, you know, this romantic power coupling. And I, I feel that in, in systems or situations where um, appearances are everything, you know, you're from this family and then you marry this other family and then you are a lawyer and she's a doctor and, you know, everybody's, you know. I, I think that there is that, there's a tension, I feel, um, in, I would say, certain middle-class Nigerian circles where there is this expectation for women to aspire and be accomplished. You know, uh, it's, you know, it's that to be romantically uh, desirable and interesting. And yet within that romantic space, they need to um, perform subservience. You know, this, that, tension you know so it's like this guy who wants to be with someone who's a doctor but she should not be a doctor when she's around him it's this weird uh mix of things you know that i think uh many people many women have probably encountered in someone that you think he, you know this person is interested in me but not quite you know um not quite the full version of myself and I, I wanted to with this relationship with Kune's insecurities and um, that tension that you so happily point to about this being the power relationship of oh this is such a good match and the awareness that something is missing in this dynamic you know um, from from probably even from both ends, you know. Um. True. So I think um, that that power coupling is also, like you're saying, very much about a, a class positioning. And I think that also because of of the the, the history that Yeye has, right, there is a, a class precarity that she's very, very aware of and that she's also very concerned about. And I think we often think of, of the, the manifestation of growing up in impoverished, right, as uh, almost like, oh, you know, it was, it was hard, but we don't think about how that manifests in, in people's daily behavior. So I think about Yeye's hoarding, how she holds on to the gold, but also how she holds on to, to physical possessions and how that in many ways affects how she socializes her children. Hmm. So Yeye is very much concerned about the parentage of the person that you're going to be seeing and the person you're going to be marrying, but also the kind of wife that you're going to be because almost she almost attaches a value, a class value around that. And I think it's really interesting that Yeye is, is, is written in the way that she is, right? Because undoubtedly Yeye loves her children. And there is a there is a complexity in that that she's a mother who loves her children, but she's also a mother who is deeply traumatized by her upbringing. And I'm curious about that complexity of character, right? Like, Yeye is not just a good mom. Yeye is a good mom with problems, right? It's like, she's a good mom with problems that she socializes into her children, right? So, <laughs> if Mutara wasn't there, you wonder if. Wura would have been able to make the decision to walk away in the way that she did. What would they would would Yeye be more obsessed with appearances and what that what that seems to be than the reality of what her child was experiencing? And I found mm. that to be a very interesting moral tag, right? Mm. Yeah. So I I think as a writer, I'm very interested in those um those slippery um tensions within a character themselves you know I find it very fascinating because I think that 
many people are uh, are self contradictory, and I'm interested in those moments. You know, so like you pointed out, the woman who she cares deeply for her children, and yet, you know, this is who she is. This is how she's come up in life, and for her, marriage. I don't think that marriage is necessarily about love in her perspective. You know, I think she she's like how she she thinks of it as a tool, you know, and it has to bring something um, to the to to her life um, besides love. Love would be a nice bonus, but I don't think that's a primary consideration. I think what she's thinking about for her children is have they made a good match? Have they made a match that would give them stability in life? Have they made a match? And when she's thinking about stability, she's thinking about financial stability in very clear terms. Uh, Because I think she, like you said, she's more in touch with how precarious things that can be than say her husband is, you know, um, because of the particular experiences she's had. And she's come up, she's, she's, she's become a person who occupies a position in society that I don't think she necessarily anticipated, you know, uh, besides the way that her sister, her older sister, you know, herded the younger ones in a particular direction. Um, and she is clinging onto it. Um, she is, our sense of identity is now locked into this and it's not something she's willing to let go of or willing to let slip in any way. Um, so that um, fair, you know, and I think that's what it really is with her, that deep down she's afraid of losing everything again. And she wants to make sure that even if she does, our children are going to be fine. And unfortunately, um, (laughs) the children are not okay, or at least one of them is not okay. Um, Because partly because of this sense, this desire even to protect, you know, that child and secure a future um, for that child. Um, You're both such... um, perceptive and astute readers. Thank you. Um, One last word before we go to the other part of the book, because Enola is also, and Enola's family is actually a a wonderful place of like, just a spell of good things. Uh, It's good. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing about Kunle because who? Kunle is a mess. Oh my gosh. You know what is really frustrating, and I think you 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 did this so wonderfully, is that often violence comes with a lot of manipulation, right, and false acts of redemption, right. So we do see Kunle kind of acknowledge that the things he's doing are incorrect and say, "Oh my gosh, I have a problem, and we need to deal with the problem." But we know that that is kind of, it's manipulative, right? It's like, yes, who I care about you and I, I have a problem. But, you know, you kind of also made me do this. So like, like stop, stop doing this so that I can stop doing this, you know? Not being yourself, right? Because yeah. actually being yourself provokes me to violence. Exactly. And, and mm-hmm. for me, I wanted to speak a little bit about that, right? Kind of this false act of redemption, right? But manipulation, because effectively what it's doing is that the violence escalates and as the violence escalates, the pretense of redemption also escalates, right? Uh, and I wanted to speak a little bit about that, just the how you brought that to the fore to be like, we know that he knows it's wrong. Hmm. And he, wants, he admits it's wrong and he needs help, but he keeps doing it. Yes. Um... And I think that he keeps doing it because, partly because there is something in this relationship for him, as you know. Um, well, he didn't become a doctor, but at least a married one. You know, there's somewhere in his mind where it's it's important for him to marry her. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, he would really like her to be a little less 
human, you know, a little less a self. Um, because, because what the push and pull is re- really is about is the full expression of Rola's range of humanity. Mm. And that's where that you made me do a thing is such a, it's such a dangerous thing, you know, because it's almost like you have to be less than human for this to work, you know, and, and, and he keeps coming back with this, uh, effusive and like you said you know more and more grand gestures of contrition and I I don't I don't even know that it's dishonest but there is this deep divide in himself in which he has a stake in making the relationship get to the point where they are married and he can say Oh, yeah, my wife wife is this and that and this and that, you know, (laughs) and the prestige that that, you know, gives to him. But he actually can't be with this woman. You know, he he doesn't have the capacity to allow her or or to exist in a place where she's also existing in her full self and thinking and talking and questioning him he he cannot abide that and I swear to you he would have killed her that's what I'm saying he would have killed her yeah I think so he would have and what I think is interesting is that long before he would have killed her physically there would have been a way in which he kills her personal ambitions her sense of self her desires because that's what it looks like to be in a relationship with somebody who whose ego is far larger than their capacity to see you as human. Um, and it's just a thing about how you Absolutely. So I'm I mean, interested. No, no, um, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, what you said brought this to my mind. You know, when I was working on it, there was this case of a gentle... Oh, no, not a gentleman. It's a man. Um, not at all a gentleman. Um, who, had, who had killed his wife um, in, in, in Lagos. And he had stabbed her so many times, um, and it was a, it was such a terrible situation. They they had a little child, and he he had been violent towards her before, to the point where she had even left him, you know, and gone to be with her family, and then she came back, you know, and that's when that happened. And I remember this must have been at some point, maybe twenty fourteen, you know that this happen it was a very you know I, if I think well enough I can even probably remember the names it was a very publicized case because you know he, he, he came to court with this defense that she had committed suicide um, nobody commits suicide by stabbing themselves 27 times or however many times he, you know at some point they're going to stop it was obviously a lie. The neighbors had witnessed the violence and were there to testify in court. But one of the things that tr- I was transfixed by was how he was weeping. You know, at some point, after, one, one, some day after the it was it had been in court, I saw this video of him leaving the court, and he was just, you know, weeping. And I, I. <sighs> It, it was uh, it was an image that stayed, you know, in my mind as I was working on this book and thinking about Kunle's character and all these genuflections he does about how sorry he is. And, you know, when I looked at how he was, you know, you'd think, oh, this guy couldn't hurt a fly. And I, and I remember thinking, is this how he was weeping to this woman? You know, is this how he was presenting himself to her? after those moments, you know, that she felt she could go back to him and be safe. Um, yeah. So I, this is this interesting yes. that this is how we start the conversation around Iniola because Iniola's father is particularly interesting as a character, right? So we think about how his mother 
actively participates in the protection of his image, right? Because mm-hmm. patriarchy dictates that she has to protect her husband, right? As the wife, you protect your husband's image. But that same patriarchy and that that masculinity is often what I think renders his father unable to get the help that he needs, right? So there is a protection that is rendered to the father in the sense that, of course, he's the man of the house. We don't question why he does the things that he does. And he's allowed to almost wallow in this self-pity for mm. however long that it takes, right? Mm. In ways that would just be unacceptable for Inyola's mother. So Inyola's mm. mother is an expectation that these are her children. She must get up and make a plan and make things mm. work. And Yola's father is allowed to almost wallow in the self-pity because woe is he. How dare he be asked to, you know, leave his job and he experienced all these government cuts. And I found that whole interplay interesting because there's just something so telling about the fact that it was Eniola's father who was the teacher, who was the respected member of society, who then also loses his job. And his mother is the one who's then expected to participate in this performance. And I wondered if you could just speak a little bit about that family dynamic as being mm-hmm. so central to some mm-hmm. of the things. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that, that loss of his job is, you know, it happens before the novel begins, but it's really the thing that um, sets a lot of the events of the novel uh, in motion. And it is it's a character that, uh, you know, with him, you know, I, I think that, I think that even before the loss of his job is someone who's always sort of struggled, you know, with his mental health. And he, he, it's, he, it's not, it's, it, he's always been able to sort of, you know, find ways to cope and without getting the necessary help that he needs. But this blow has sort of taken him out. And with him, one of the things that I was interested in was to consider how this expectations around masculinity can trap men, you know, themselves. Um, it's it's in how he is he, 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 he is now even in the thinking of many people around him, not um, is 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 quote unquote not a man anymore because. He's lost his job. He's not providing, and he's also internalized that. You know, he's, he's he's processing that within himself, and it's making whatever uh, pre-existing condition he had is is you know just taking him further and further and further down. And there is also that other dimension of the sense that because he's a man, because he's the man. Ooh, you know, he's been educated, he was a teacher, he can't bring himself to um, quote-unquote demean himself in certain ways. Uh, he can't bring himself to take on, you know, some of the things that any lot's mother would take on and just do. Uh, um, so I, I wanted to think with him and through him about that entrapment, you know, that as long as is ticking off certain boxes, all is well in the world. Um, when he has his job and, you know, they have this little car and he's bringing money, you know, he, he feels a sense of confidence that totally disappears once all of that is gone, you know, that even within the family, even in the relationship where I think his wife gives him a lot of grace. I don't think it's something that he's allowing to necessarily enter to the deepest parts of himself um, because there is this ideal of the provider that he is now no longer, you know, um, even if momentarily not able to be. And um, yeah, so it's is, 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 is an interesting one. And um, within your last mother, you know, she's coming into this relationship and, you know, at the beginning, she thought she would be able to have some income, you know, um, she tries all these businesses that don't quite work out. And I think that after 
her husband loses his job, somewhere in her mind she thinks, okay, it's now my opportunity to sort of show that I can also make things happen here. But then it goes on and on and on and on and on, and it gets to a point where the weight becomes unbearable for her because he needs help, you know. And even though she loves him and gives him grace, that is not a substitute for the kind of help help that he needs, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's, I feel like it's interesting because you said this earlier, you know, some people believe that this could be two different novels, right? But I think that what you do so brilliantly is the undercurrent of the stories between uh, Wura's family and Inola's family, but in, in, in such a way that you could also miss the kind of juxtaposition, right, and and, and kind of the the really stark visceral differences between these two people. Because I think about like kind of Inola's family as the idea and the the impoverished nature and the poverty that they live under as kind of, as the spectacle of poverty. I feel like the story really showed you the spectacle of poverty, right? So you think about the ways in which Inola is forced to effectively leave school, right? Like, because he may not he he may not be the bright one, but he can go and and find work, right, and and continue the seamstress job. But for me, what was deeply like profound, and even the moment when Ye Ye encounters Inola again, is that Inola now had pretended that he's blind in order to get like money for food, right? And and I do say spectacle because I feel like poverty has really made some of us do incredibly wonderful, ridiculous things in order to get food, in order to do a particular things, right? And I wanted to speak about that, right? Kind of the spectacle of poverty. But I also think what poverty does and what you explore in the book is this idea of stripping of humanity, right? So you think about like the ways in which Inola and the boys for the neighborhood are used because in some ways their lives are, they count for nothing. So they would be, if we are to send grievable losses, because who cares about people who are impoverished? Who cares about people who, who don't have a future in the way that we mm. may understand it? Mm. And I wanted to, 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 for you to speak a little bit about that, because I thought that was really fascinating to think about like Wura's world and Ye Ye's world and like just underneath it to say like, there's actually, Ye Ye is a spectacle of wealth, but Inola's story is a spectacle of poverty. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's it was. I wanted, you know, one of the things I wanted was to make so many, like you said, so many of those experiences, um, very visible and visceral. So, for instance, when we meet Aniela, um, in the in the in the book, the first um scene of the book is him going to buy this newspaper and essentially being humiliated, um, by the vendor. You know, and it's it's sort of um, it's 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 it gives you an insight into some of the experiences he's had, you know, up, up until that point, and what that positioning exposes him to and makes him vulnerable to, you know. And you know, on the other side, when when we meet Wurala for the first time, you know, she's in the hospital, she's encountering the patient, and you know, she had this interaction with this patient's relative where she perceives that he's being sexist towards her and she's sort of thinking you wouldn't interact this way with the man who's a doctor so right from the beginning I wanted to sort of set up you know the the what is the thing that these characters are pushing against you know whether conscious whether they're even already conscious of how um how much of an obstacle it is for them or not and with Eniola it was you know, I, I wanted to really um, think about the granular consequence, you know, of this kind of grinding poverty, of which in Nigeria there is a lot of it, you know. And, you know, sometimes when I think about this book, I feel like the, it's it's a book that could, you know, many of the things that happen there, if you look at, if you read Nigerian newspapers for a year, I'm sure you find an example of each and every one of them. But I wanted it to sort of go behind the numbers, which are sometimes easily forgotten. You know, this X and the X 
and mon- number of students are out of school. Um, and I wanted to look at one of those children and one of those students and see, first of all, um, is humanity, you know, that's the thing that I'm interested in, you know, is heart, is, 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 is desires, is aspiration, the way is moving through the world, the way is trying to survive. And to juxtapose that with this constant humiliation, you know, that the fact that he's from a poor family imposes on him and on his family, you know, and um, what that does to how he is thinking about the decisions he's making and the choices he's making and what he's willing to do as a result. And like you said, those young boys, um, many people in, in many instances, their lives are, 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 are thought of as, you know, dispensable in some kind of way. Um, and their, their, their tragedies are not, to my mind, often um, thought through as tragic. I, I don't know if that is making sense. You know, even if you th- yeah. think of the reporting around, you know, uh, people like him, whether it's new site him or, you know, and and I and I I, I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to counter, uh, hopefully counter that, um, by saying, this is an ongoing tragedy, you know, mm. in 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 our communities. Um, but I think also powerfully to say that these are people, right? Like to yeah. you, it is stories, but these are people. This is a young boy who has aspirations to do something with his life. But because of the structure and the power and the impoverishment, he may just become another boy. Mm. He is someone. And I think I think it's particularly interesting to think about the lack of the resolution towards the end of the book, right? So well, so particularly as it relates to Eniola's sister and to contrast that with Wura's father. So there is this tragic thing that happens. Wura's father, you know, has an entire search party. The world almost comes to a grinding halt. And even upon the discovery of, of you know, their bodies, there's a, there's a juxtaposition of Wura's father, who is this grand, important, respected person. And then, of course, there is uh, Eniola's sister, who doesn't who barely get to mention. No one wonders where she's from, who she possibly is, what the story may be. And it seems like there's a final enactment of just, like, the violence of inequality, even in death, even in death, you know, and death is thought to be this great equalizer. You know, we often get told we're all going to die one day. Everybody gets buried six feet under. There's no special sort of measurement for you. But even in death, right, even in death, there is an inequality. Even in death, (laughs) death in many ways actually serves to be like the final enforcer of all of these inequalities because there is a resolution that Wura's family gets. There is a closure. There is a reality that is denied to Eniola's family. And nobody is concerned. It's almost like, oh, these things happen to children from this place. And so it's just business as usual. And I think that it's it's so poignant that even in closing, right, that even in the final stage of just being a human in the circle of life, there's still this lack of resolution, there's still this lack of closure. And I'm curious about why you wrote that in the way that you did. Because they it it, it for me that was potentially one of the most painful parts of the book was realizing that even this thing that is meant to be the great and the final equalizer is just a highlight of just the inequalities and how unfair life can be to somebody like mm. Eola. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, 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 that idea of it being the equalizer, I think the fact of it is true, but I think that it, it, it's, it's not totally exactly in that way. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to consider um, with this. Because even the idea of the equalizer, there are people who end up 
at that point earlier than they should have because they couldn't pay an hospital bill, you know, and the people who are able to afford to um, continue living beyond a certain point because they have wealth, you know, so that it's, it's, it was something that the fact of what happens to both families is the same, but the experience of it, like you said, is, is very different uh, because we're our last family. It, it does not diminish the tragedy of their loss, but they have access in a way that in your last family doesn't. They can call the HOD of this and say, you know, this is what is going on. You know, they have inroads into places that and your last family cannot even approach. Um, so that, huh, that that closing it was it was difficult to write. You know, once I realized where it was going to, because there is that sense of collective destiny. You know that that I, that I talked about in the beginning, but mm -hmm. I I also think that um, the way it is structured, some people still do suffer more than others. You yeah. Know? Um, mm -hmm. That some, some people still do suffer more and um, behooves us as, 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 a, as a society to really look that in the face, you know, to really look. And that's, you know, one of the things I was hoping um, would happen with this book, particularly when I think about people reading it in Nigeria. I wanted it to make people feel uncomfortable um, by the time they were done. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that... Um... You know, when you're like optimistic because you yeah. like a spell of good things, right? So, Aww. right? And then you're like, oh no, girl, there's no <laughs> spell of good things. Right? So, for I me, the ending was like, like, my heart like, was like, the was like, was like oh, it was like, oh, it was no a, when I read that part of the book, I actually had to close this. I remember, I, I remember that scene so clearly because I was in bed. I was breastfeeding my baby. Oh. I read that scene and I closed it. And I was just like, no, you know what? <laughs> no. I was just like, no. There, is, there are no good things. <laughs> there are no good things. There's not a spell of good things. Oh, my God. That, that, that is the mark of excellent writing is to make your reader feel so viscerally what you've written, that even in their daily practice, how they think about certain things has changed. Yeah. Because for me, it was like also like evil, how evil can like manifest, right? And like evil leads to the death of innocent people effectively, right? Like this allurement and, and, and lust for power is ultimately why the tragedy happens, right? But I, I suppose in keeping with the spell of good things, I wanted to say that for me, the spell of good thing was Motera. Like, my girl, like, my girl. I was just like, yes, queen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a time where she's like, uh, but why can't Kunle help you? Me, I'm resting now. Let the people, the servers help you. It's like, she's like, we live in this luxurious house where there are servants and you want me to labor. No, I won't labor. I won't labor. <laughs> Interesting, because Matara, in many ways, Tokunolo gets to benefit from not being the oldest daughter who's an African child. And that is important, right? That often people recognize that they have freedom, but your freedom is also precipitated on sometimes lots of factors that are outside of your own like yeah. free will and your ability to navigate certain things. And often people think I'm so free and I'm so powerful because of my own doing. But in many ways, it's because there are people who've had to labor and experience particular things in order for you to be able to navigate the world in the way that you do. So if she didn't have a war, would she be able to be like, Oh my God, I, I'm, not this thing. I'm done with that. Um, I'm yeah, yeah, too good. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we need to also interrogate that and maybe I'm just biased because I'm the oldest African daughter <laughs> that, is the, problem. that is the problem I mean I'm the I'm oldest I'm with kid. you and the older <laughs> that's it <laughs> and you know but that I'm... the Motaras in your life are so convinced <laughs> that they are like so progressive but your progression and your progressiveness is also rested on the fact that there are people who've been able who've had to do very particular forms of labor in order for you 
to wrestle with the freedom that you do right so like yeah. even in that freedom I, I i want those kind of people to extend a particular empathy to the women in their lives who may not have arrived at that place right because Laura is not at that place for a reason i'm yeah. just saying <laughs> I but, I, but i also feel that uh the kind of privilege and freedom is also how Mutera is able to like, she's baffled, right, by the idea of this person who's opened these parts for me, this person who's allowed me to have this space is being beaten. And she's not saying anything about it. She basically said, no, you didn't see what you see. So for Mutera, it's like mind boggling to be like, Dr. Hura, this is what you're doing. No, Dr. Hura. No, you can't, you can't, you can't. You know the time when she sends uh, SMSs and she she's just like, she's, she's you know, flabbergasted by the fact that my Dr. Hura is doing these things, right? And so for me, Matera is interesting for that reason, because in as much as she's like a, a, a spoiled brat, if we can call it that, right? She's also really empathetic to like, but Hura, you're better than this, my girl, right? Mm-hmm. Like. You 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 gotta you gotta show up differently, you know. Um, and I appreciated that. I appreciated that that there was someone in Hura's corner because I don't know if Mutaro is there where the Hura was going to go. I don't know. I don't know because what okay. you said earlier on Ayobami is that even though she couldn't hear it at that moment, it was at the back of her mind, right? Mm. So we know the moments when she was looking at her phone by herself alone. She was really like, okay, like. Also, it happened in the presence of other people, so it did actually happen, you know. Mm. Um, so for me, I feel like she was kind of a spell of good thing. Um, Tara is a real one. A spoiled the, one? A real one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she's something, and and I, I like I also like what Halma said because there's a sense in which he is able to sort of let her be because she already has, you know, the daughter that oh, has gone. Yes, Dr. Ura, who's getting married. <laughs> it's like, well, this one. Ayobami, <laughs> um, this has been a really wonderful conversation. As you can tell, we've really loved a spell of good things. But I suppose if you, you know, were to kind of have a moment to speak to all your readers, right? And you're supposed to be like, okay, there is one thing I need you to get out of this book, right? <laughs> like, there are these things. What do you hope your sophomore novel will do? Huh. I mean, I, I hope, you know, it's it's a book that is is very, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday or two days ago. Um, and maybe sometimes I'll I'll write the thing I was thinking eventually, you know, about how it is a book that I think is decidedly um Nigerian in a certain way. Like it, it's very particular in the prism, you know, or the perspective that it has. And I, and I, that's one of the places where I hope it will do something. And I and I guess there's a sense in which it's it's almost a cry of a cry for help or a cry a cry of some kind, you know. And and I, I hope that it jolts, you know, in, in a way that can have impact and can have um hopefully some positive consequence. Um even if it's just on an interpersonal level, but mm-hmm. mostly I hope on, on a more systemic level, because I, I do think that there is a limit to um, to the distance that individual charity can go, you know, and then that's about what happens in the book. Um, yeah, that there are instances where what needs to happen is more systemic change. So, yeah, that's a long-winded answer, but no, I mean, I, I think it's beautiful. I, I wanted to say that you, you said. The, the book is, you know, kind of decidedly Nigerian, but I would say decidedly African, right? Because I, I, I read this and I thought, yeah. Damn, like, this happens in our community, right? Mm, like, yeah. the, the contrast and the, the kind of connivingness, the poverty, the uh, socialization is like, it's, yeah. it's very Nigerian. And I really appreciated that. I, I appreciated that, like, like you're saying, right? Like, there is no gaze that is in the book, right? Like, mm. You can't read the story any other way but the way in which you intended it to be mm. to be read. And and we like we loved a spell of good things and like mm. we hope 
you know, that it gets shortlisted for many more prizes, right? Thank you. Ah! Thank you so much. I really, I mean, this has been very, very enjoyable. You know, you, I, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure you've got some of this from other writers. As a writer, you, 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 you put all these things in, you know, you put all these details and all these threads and you guys saw everything, even the one that was bubbling under the surface. You guys took the torchlight and found it. And <laughs> it's very gratifying <laughs> um, yeah. to feel that, you know, it, it, it was worth it. Um, it it really was. Readers really was. like you make it feel, oh, you know, yeah. worth it. Thank you so That's much really for awesome. reading so carefully so and so thoughtfully. All right, chicken agents. We are so excited for this book and we're excited to see what the book will do. We are crossing fingers not only for the Booker Prize, but like the Top Mother said, for multiple, multiple more awards. But also, I guess, as a as an encouragement to other writers that we can tell our stories with the vulnerability, with the complexity, with the tenderness that they need, without having to write for a particular gaze in order to receive the appreciation that our writing needs. And I think that's such a powerful lesson and so important for young writers as well. So thank you for writing this beautiful book. Um, it was a spell of good things to read. <laughs> Um, and I know I was I was very emotional about the ending, but this was such a beautiful book, and I think that it did it did what it needed to do. And so, thank you for doing that. So, you know. I suppose thank before you. we let you go, Ayobami, perhaps to just um, titillate our listeners and our mm-hmm. uh, and our, our watchers. Uh, just a bit about the book, right? So you can choose any kind of uh, passage where you want to read from, huh. but just to give a sense of uh, kind of, you know, uh, what to expect when they enter huh. a spell of good things. Okay, nice. I'm going to read a fun bit. Let me let me just find my place in the book. Um, it's I'm reading from chapter six, I think. <laughs> And it's, it's you know, Yeye, who's the mother from the wealthy family, has, you know, at the beginning of the book, there's this big party that's about to happen. And it's in the lead up to the party. Hmm. And it's about, you know, when Urala's aunties arrive, you know, with all their, you know, the aunties love expressed as disapproval. Um yeah. Wurala's aunties descended on Wednesday. They came bearing complaints and coolers brimming with fried meats, live goats, and exclamations, jars of aboniki balm, rebukes, and bags of rice. Complaints and coolers of fried meat. Nitori alone. How could ye ye hold a party like this in a compound when it was not Wuraola's 10th birthday or Motara's naming ceremony? This was a 50th birthday care. How many people lived long enough to turn 50? Their mother, may, God, may she continue to be pampered in the afterlife, did not see the sunrise beyond her 40th birthday. And this after their father had bid the world farewell before he turned, 40, before he turned 49. Wasn't that enough reason for 50th birthdays to be celebrated by all their offspring, offspring as a victory? A great victory called for a beautiful and big celebration. And Thanksgiving, yes, of course, and Thanksgiving. Were there no event centers in this town? Yeye should have come to Lagos, Ibadan, Abuja to have this party. Was money a problem? They could all have contributed more towards the celebration. If they had done so for every sister when she turned 50, why wouldn't they be eager, happy, excited to do it for the youngest? If Yeye did not have money to throw a party, couldn't she have confided in her older sisters? Was Yeye too proud to ask for help? At the sibling cord that bound them together, weakened with time and distance? No. Why then was this important party being held on Ye Ye's lawn? If only they had known about this before they arrived, something could have been done. It was on the invite. Why would they read that when they spoke to Ye Ye every week? Why didn't Ye Ye use her mouth to tell them this was where the party would be held? Invite call, insight me. 
Anyway, this must not be allowed to repeat itself when Yeye turned 60. No way. Not when they would all be alive and well to make sure it did not. Aye. By the special grace of God, no one would be missing in the mighty name of Jesus. No one would be on the sick bed by the mercies of the Almighty. Now, who would carry the coolers inside so that Motara could count the meats? Thank <laughs> you. And you know, you have the sisters with all their effusiveness, and you, you can see that anxiety. This were women who were orphaned, you know, in a world where um, they didn't have a older brother, you know, or to, to sort of protect them from the harsh realities. And even though they're where they're occupying a certain position, there's still that, oh, we will all still be here when she's 60. Yeah. Thank Even you. Way, it's very like a black auntie, older sister. Yeah. Yeah. What is this like? Like, like you expected me to read the invitation? What? <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> but again, uh, Ayobami from the Chicken Aces makes in our deepest gratitude. We know that often writing can be such a solitude and solitary process. And we're happy that we're able to create a space for writers to really um, speak about their work and for us to let them know that, like, we've enjoyed them, you know. People say we want to give people their flowers while they can sell it, smell it. And we want to say we want to tell you you're excellent while you are here, right? Oh, uh, and we don't want you to be out in the world. But also, importantly, we want you to be able to have this kind of archive of a spell of good things so that one day mm. you're like, here is an interview. Here are the many ways in which we're showing up for each other. So thank you so much. Thank um, you for... both. I'm so, so moved. Thank you. So Cheeky Natives, uh, just to remind you, if you want to get a copy of A Spell of Good Things by Ayobami, you can contact us and we will get to make sure that you have a copy at your doorstep. And you can also enjoy what we've enjoyed, right? You can also discover that it's not a spell of good things, but it is a spell of good things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, until next time, Cheeky Natives, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.